part. So our, our really final uh, session here is uh, to bring up our own Dr. Sylvia Kurtz, who we've heard so much about and many of you know. Uh, and Dr. Kurtz is the head of our neuro-oncology program here at NYU and really an expert in running clinical trials uh, and leads most of the clinical trials that we have in our Brain and Spine Tumor Center here. So we're thrilled to have Dr. Kurtz talk to us about uh, clinical trials in a talk she's titled Moving the Needle, Clinical Trials in Neuro-Oncology. So uh, welcome to this session. Thank you for the kind introduction, and um, I also want to thank all the panelists, who, um, like the patients, caregiver who are just up, up there and sharing their touching um, experiences. So I think um, it means a lot also for us as medical providers um, to hear what that really means uh, for everyone in their everyday life. Um, so yeah, today or this afternoon, I would like to take half an hour to speak a little bit about uh, clinical trials in neuro-oncology. Um, so this is an overview over the talk here. So in general, like the first part we'll be able to talk a little bit about some general um, things, like I just outlined some definitions and things like that, because I think that is something that we don't go over too often with our patients um, in general. And then, okay, everyone hear me now? Good. All right, okay. Um, and then I'll speak a little bit about um, a few clinical trials that we have on offer for different types of conditions or that may be available uh, for different types of conditions that we readily um, see in clinic every day. Um, glioblastoma, low-grade gliomas, um, and then meningioma. Um, so there will be a big part uh, on immunotherapies for the glioblastoma session and go into like the principles behind that. And then in terms of targeted therapies, um, I'll speak a little bit more about those for um, the low-grade glioma and the meningioma part. So what is a clinical trial? So a clinical trial, um, by conducting a clinical trial, the investigator um, tries to evaluate the safety and the efficacy of a novel or promising treatment uh, for medical problems. So in our case, that is a brain tumor. Um, it's the only way for brain tumors uh, for us as researchers or investigators to um, develop and find better treatment options. Um, so it is a hallmark part of our everyday practice, um, and it is a very important part because still of our everyday work, um, because still we don't have optimal treatments available for many tumors. Um, and um, we should enroll even more patients into clinical trials that we are uh, doing right now. Um, nevertheless, it is important to understand for patients um, that treatments that are offered in clinical trial, they are considered investigational. That means that the investigator, at the time that they're performing the clinical trial, does not definitely know whether um, the new treatment is indeed going to be successful. Um, and then also, and I just put the second um, sentence in there is because a lot of patients come up to me, well, is this clinical trial better than the other clinical trial? So often I have to say I don't know because each clinical trial is an investigation by itself. These different treatments that are offered in different clinical trials, they're not compared to head to head. So I can you know, comment on um, what makes sense from a biological medical perspective, but I can't say whether one clinical trial is going to be better than the other. Um, so that's like something that patients um, also, I think, need to understand. Nevertheless, as I already said, clinical trials are possible opportunities for patients to receive a promising new treatment option that is not yet available on the regular market um, and that I cannot prescribe outside of a clinical trial. Um, and of course, we are hopeful about these clinical trials and we want patients to have the opportunity to receive these agents and we want to move the needle. We hope that this clinical trial or the treatment that's offered in a clinical trial is indeed going to be successful and the patient in front of me is going to benefit from that treatment. Um, so then I just want to go over a few, there are a few uh, some rules and principles in conducting a clinical trial. So we as investigators are bound to um, certain rules of conduct, so to speak. Um, that means, and I want to say that because sometimes patients come up and say, well, is this an experiment? I might trust your guinea pig. Um, that is, in a way, you know, we're investigating an experimental way of treating these tumors, and in a way, I don't know what the outcome is, and in a way, it is this large setup experiment, the clinical trial is. Um, but we are, as investigators, bound to certain rules um, 
when we do clinical trials. So here are some key aspects that we always have to think of. Um, the respect for persons, that we treat, uh, treat each person as an autonomous um, individual person, and we have to always respect that. Um, we want the clinical trial to benefit the patient, and then we also want the clinical trial to benefit the larger community. So we want to learn about this new treatment and hopefully benefit future generations of patients. And then we're also um, bent to the principle of justice, meaning every patient that qualifies for a clinical trial should, and wants to do a clinical trial should be enrolled, so I cannot you know, pick and choose the one person that I wanted to enroll or not. Um, all clinical trials, before they can be offered to patients, go, thorough, go through thorough evaluations. There are multiple committees that are usually involved, like the FDA has to kind of sign off on the study. Um, there are institutional review boards that have to sign off um, on the studies, and depending on what institution you go to, there are many other committees that have to approve the clinical trial before they can start. Um, and then quickly, I just want to outline some uh, clinical trial terminologies. So there are different phases of clinical trials that are available. There are phase one clinical trials, phase two clinical trials, and phase three clinical trials. I just want to go over a few principles. <clears throat> so phase one clinical trials, the goal of those is to assess the safety and tolerability of a drug, meaning the questions that the researchers ask in those studies is whether the drug is safe and does not have too many intolerable side effects. Um, that also means that sometimes these uh, studies are considered dose-finding studies, um, where we don't know the optimal dose of a new treatment yet, um, and therefore in different, at different stages of this clinical trial, patients will receive lower or higher doses of a given drug. That means by participating in a trial, you may receive a relatively lower dose of what becomes then the so-called recommended phase two dose. And then phase three clinical trial, I'm sorry, Phase two clinical trials are dose studies where we now know the right and the correct dose. We know that the drug is um, overall safe and doesn't have too many side effects. Now we want to find out, does it make a difference? And we study that first in a smaller group of patients. So it's a, um, a smaller group of patients where we just want to know how this performs. And typically the results from that study are uh, compared to what we call historical controls. Um, one of the big advantages of the phase two study for the patient is um, that in that phase two study, everyone is getting the correct dose of the drug, and everyone is actually getting the drug. So there is no randomness to whether you're assigned to the treatment arm or the, the, um, the placebo arm. Then there are phase three studies, and those are really the studies that are performed with those agents and um, the most promising treatment options. So those studies are evaluating a type of treatment that has already passed through the phase one, the phase two stage, and now what we want to know is if this new drug or treatment is actually performing better than the best established treatment option that we have available so far. Um, that means the advantage of those studies is that these drugs and treatments are the furthest along in the development. That means we are the most hopeful about those. They're the most promising treatment options. The caveat that is often perceived by patients is that they often are so-called randomized studies. That means there is a placebo arm to it. And um, to improve the rigor of the clinical data that we obtain, um, you as patients and we as investigators don't know whether you're actually receiving the treatment or you're actually receiving a placebo. And then, like, who is doing a clinical trial? There's always a principal investigator. That's the person who conducts the study. Um, and that is responsible and also accountable for all the research that is conducted under a given clinical trial. You may hear, hear a similar term that's called the site principal investigator. That applies to those so-called multi-center clinical trials, uh, where, like, a clinical trial is offered at many institutions, and um, that at each, in each institution, there is a principal investigator that is responsible for the research that is conducted at that institution. And then another term is the sponsor. So um, sometimes patients ask me, well, can I use drug X, Y, and Z while I'm on the study? And then I tell them, well, let me check back with the sponsor whether that's okay. Um, so the sponsor is usually can be a person, an institution, or an organization company who initiates, manages, and finances the study. So that is like also another um, oversight committee, so to speak. Um, often it is the pharmaceutical company and um, they have the most experience with like, 
especially under multicenter studies with like drug drug interactions and things like that. So that's why we are turning to the sponsor for information on these kinds of questions. So just to summarize that part, um, why participating in a clinical trial? Um, so for brain tumors, established treatment options are often limited. So we don't have often good um, and promising treatments available or they're not good enough to cure the disease. Um, and then participating in a clinical trial may benefit you as the patient who's receiving a new and promising treatment um, that is available during the, through this clinical trial. And then participation in a clinical trial may benefit future patients because we as investigators learn about this new treatment and we learn whether it's, it is more efficacious um, and whether it is indeed better than what we have available so far. Of course, there are potential downsides. Why not participating in a clinical trial? So you as patients may receive a treatment that ends up not to be successful. You may encounter side effects that we don't know about or that are unique to the new treatment that we're giving to you. And by participating in a clinical trial and because of all the rules and regulations that we have to um, adhere to, you may end up having more frequent doctor visits. You may have additional imaging tests and additional blood work tests. There may be questionnaires that take up a lot of time, so you will, may spend more time in the doctor's office by participating in a clinical trial. And then when to do a clinical trial. So this is just a graph um, that is illustrating uh, the clinical trial landscape, so to speak, for glioblastoma. Um, so clinical trials are available at the time when you find out about the tumor, at time of diagnosis, and then they may become available also at time when the tumor comes back. Um, and um, so what I'm showing you here in this diagram is like in blue, it's like the standard of care option that is always available there, and then there's standard of care option that are available at time of recurrence, but then they become, the standard of care option come, become fewer and fewer as time goes on. Um, then there are targeted therapy clinical trials, there are immunotherapy clinical trials that can be available at um, initial diagnosis. Usually those are much fewer in number and they become much more in number um, at time of first recurrence, second recurrence. And then as time goes on and the tumor becomes um, recurrent more often, the clinical trial available, availability goes um, down then. The reason why I'm illustrating this to you is that um, Clinical trials A are, yes, available at usually every time point in this um, disease process. However, they're probably most readily available at first or second recurrence. So my recommendation to patients usually is to consider a clinical trial before going to a standard of care option at time of first recurrence if they haven't already done a clinical trial at um, time of diagnosis and to reserve standard of care treatment options or the established treatment option for the future time point when clinical trials may not be available to you, but those options remain available to you because you haven't used them up, so to speak. So with that, I want to move to the second part of the, the, this presentation. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about glioblastoma um, and what are the currently established options and um, what the immunotherapies for glioblastomas are, are looking like. So to summarize um, what we know about glioblastoma, it's the most common malignant brain tumor. There are about 12,000 cases diagnosed in the United States each, States each year. Patients usually present um, when they're in their 50s to 60s. Um, nevertheless, there is a range of age, so people may be younger or older than that age group. Um, risk factors are poorly defined, so we don't clearly know why patients develop these tumors. Um, there's a possible association with therapeutic radiation that has been delivered to the head and neck area before the tumor was diagnosed. Apart from that, there are very few risk factors that have been established. In less than 1% of patients, is there a hereditary cancer syndrome that runs in their, to, in their families? Um, but studies have shown no association with other you know, potential cancerogenic agents, cell phone use, smoking. Um, there has been a possible questionable association with infection with a um, virus called CMV. However, that has not been confirmed. Patients with glioblastoma typically, and we have heard that a lot today, uh, present with headaches, nausea, vomiting. They can have seizures or neurological symptoms depending on where their tumor is located. On an MRI scan, they usually look like um, these tumors that 
pick up contrast and then have like the swelling and edema around the tumor region. region. What treatments do we have available right now? So the first step always is tumor resection. That gives us the pathological diagnosis and allows identification of important molecular biomarkers, which are important things to know even for the future because that will define, on, um, define what clinical trials or treatments might be available to the patient. Um, so I just want to outline the IDH mutations that we also heard about today, the MGMT methylation, and then other possible treatment targets. I want to spend uh, just a few minutes on the MGMT methylation part um, that was that came up um, earlier today also. So MGMT stands for the O-methylguanine methyl transferase. Um, that is a DNA repair enzyme. Um, and that can either be turned on in your tumor or it can be turned off. If we say the patient's MGMT is unmethylated, then that means that DNA repair enzyme is active. That means or can mean that tumor is resistant to alkylating chemotherapy. If we say that the tumor is MGMT methylated, and that means this DNA repair enzyme is inactive in the tumor. And that means that this tumor may be more susceptible to the alkylating chemotherapy. And overall, we've learned um, over many studies um, that this confers a better prognosis, and that means that patients do respond better to temozolomide and CCNU chemotherapy. And this is a study where this difference was clearly demonstrated. Um, that MGMT is an important prognostic biomarker. Um, and I also want to just outline or just explain the graph because there will be a couple graphs uh, similar to that. So what I show you here is a so-called uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Um, this is like a lot of oncology trials are conducted. Um, on the y-axis you see um, the probability of survival, and then on the x-axis you see the amount of time that has passed. So whenever there is a step down on each of these curves, that means an event has occurred. That can either be the tumor has recurred, depending on what the curve is looking at, or the patient has died. So in this case, um, I'm showing you the overall survival, meaning that each step down in a curve means that the patient unfortunately has passed away. Um, that means that when you now look at the blue curve, Overall, they have less patients passed away compared to the red curve. That means that the blue curve overall has performed better than the red curve. And what you see um, here is that the blue curve are those people who have MGMT methylated tumors, and the red curve is those tumors that have MGMT unmethylated tumors. So overall, the take home message from this graph is that MGMT methylated tumors overall perform better when they receive radiation and chemotherapy compared to the MGMT unmethylated tumors. So, um, that's what I wanted to say about the MGMT methylation. And uh, because of the importance of the MGMT methylated, methylation, this, the recommendation outside of a clinical trial, um, the available treatment option for glioblastoma is always to do radiation combined with chemotherapy. As we have heard earlier today is that um, 65 years fit patients uh, typically receive six weeks of treatment. And then typically patients older than 65 treatments receive three weeks of radiation. And then the temozolomide chemotherapy is given in conjunction with the radiation, but then is followed up after the radiation where patients do monthly cycles of chemotherapy. And then this is again, like a similar graph that we saw right now, this is just to illustrate that the combination treatment, again highlighted in blue, is performing better than um, radiation alone, which is highlighted in red. And that is shown for MGMT methylated patients. It was the same curve that I showed you before. But then also, most importantly, it's also true for unmethylated MGMT patients. And um, this part, like about 10% of patients, um, seem to also derive a benefit from the combination of radiation and chemotherapy, although they're MGMT unmethylated. Therefore, we usually recommend that patients, even if they're MGMT unmethylated, for those patients who cannot participate in clinical trial, always should get both radiation and chemotherapy. And then what we also have available for glioblastoma patients is the Novacure device. Um, that is like the newest established FDA-approved treatment because it also has shown that adding the Novacure device to temozolomide does improve overall outcome for patients. 
At time of recurrence, however, when the patient's glioblastomas do recur, we have very limited options. So we talk about another surgery, we talk about more radiation. These may or may not be options, um, depending on what the situation of the patient looks like. Chemotherapy options are limited at that time. So then the only best next option becomes participation in a clinical trial. And now I want to speak so in general, there are immunotherapies available for glioblastomas and targeted therapies, but I want to highlight the immunotherapy piece here. So immunotherapies for glioblastoma. I want to take a moment to walk you through that slide, and that just is to outline um, the interaction of immunotherapies and cancer. Um, so I want to start on the bottom here. Um, so this is to illustrate how the immune system and the cancer cell interact with each other and how different types of immunotherapies can be useful there. Um, so down here, number one, we see that you have the tumor here. What happens when you give chemotherapy and radiation to the patient is that we kill tumor cells. When tumor cells are killed, they do release little proteins or little peptides that we call antigens. And these antigens are being picked up by specialized immune cells that we call antigen-presenting cells. We need those antigen-presenting cells as so-called messengers that then uh, travel to lymph nodes, and in the lymph nodes they interact with other immune cells called T cells. They, the antigen-presenting cells have picked up those antigens and show them to the other immune cells and say, this looks abnormal, I want you to find that protein or that peptide and then eliminate those cells that express that protein or peptide. Then once we have educated those T cells here in the lymph nodes, the T cells go into the bloodstream, they travel through the bloodstream, they go to, through the blood-brain barrier, um, and then they go back into the tumor, and then in the tumor, these immune cells attack the tumor cells that represent the same flags, the same proteins and the same peptides. And then along all these different stations here in this process, we have certain drugs that we can use um, to enhance the efficacy of the immune attack against the tumor. So for instance, the antigen presentation, we can enhance by giving vaccine therapies to the patient to interest to introduce certain pro-inflammatory cytokines or molecules into the tumor tissue or into the patient. Um, then at the interaction between the T cells and the antigen presenting cells, we have specialized treatments, um, so-called checkpoint inhibitors that target CTLA-4 and other markers. Then the T cells have to travel through the bloodstream. There are certain ways that we can help enhance that trafficking into the brain tumor back into the tissue. Um, and then in the tumor tissue, we have other treatments that enhance the aggressiveness or the activity of the immune cells against the cancer cells. And um, so I'm going to start out and talk about how we can improve treatments for this aspect of things, like the aggressiveness or the activity of the immune cells in the tumor itself, and then how we can improve the priming of the immune cells in the periphery, like in the general body. I think just in the interest of time, um, no, I'm going over this uh, just in, for a brief moment of time. So in terms of intra improving the interaction between the immune cells and the tumor cells, we have so-called checkpoint inhibitors, and you probably heard about them. There are the drugs that are called nivolumab or Opdivo, pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, or Yervo. There are multiple different agents available on the market. All what they do is they're trying to improve the activity of immune cells against the tumor cells. And that can happen in the tumor itself. That is true for so-called PD-1 inhibitors or PDL one inhibitors, such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, semiplimab. But then um, Another way of enhancing the activity of the immune cells against the tumor cells is in the periphery, like in the lymph nodes, and that is by giving um, CTLA-4 targeting checkpoint inhibitors. Um, the most commonly known is ipilimumab or Yervoy. And then other ways of enhancing that attack is uh, by giving vaccine strategies that, again, improve that antigen, presenting, uh, antigen presentation to the T cells. 
So what, that, what does that mean for patients with glioblastoma? So there are checkpoint inhibitors um, that are currently studied in newly diagnosed glioblastoma. There are currently two key uh, clinical trials that are available at multiple institutions. Um, there's Checkmate 548 that is um, evaluating the utility of nivolumab in combination of the radiation and the chemotherapy against the so-called against the so placebo arm that is evalu evaluating the radiation and chemotherapy plus a placebo agent. That is a randomized phase three study. Um, it is currently ongoing, and we kind of are currently continuously updated about the results. However, the final results will not be available until August of 2023. There is another clinical study that has now completed accrual, um, although the results have not been officially published yet. That is Checkmate 498. Um, that is evaluating um, patients with unmethylated glioblastomas, for which we think the temozolomide is only useful in a smaller subset of patients. So in this clinical trial, patients receive radiation plus temozolomide chemotherapy, and those patients are com compared against patients who receive radiation and nivolumab. That is a randomized phase three study also, um, and we do expect the results to become available at the large neuro-oncology meeting um, in Phoenix, Arizona in November this year. Uh, what we have heard, however, by a press release is that unfortunately this clinical trial did not meet its primary endpoint. Um, so we don't know whether this is truly going to be an effective approach. I want to highlight that we have a clinical trial that's very similar to um, the clinical trials that I was just describing um, at NYU that is offering a so-called hyperfractionated radiation schema together with a combination treatment of ipilimumab, which is targeting the CTLA-4 agent, uh, CTLA-4 on the peripheral immune cells with nivolumab that is targeting the PD-1 axis in the tumor cells. That is also open to unmethylated MGMT um, promoter patients, and that is a, um, a study that's open to newly diagnosed patients. It's an open-label phase two study. Uh, we have completed a safety lead-in uh, phase. All patients tolerated it okay, so we were allowed to go into the phase two stage of the study. All patients on the study receive radiation for three weeks, and we combined the radiation uh, with ipilimumab and nivolumab treatment. The patients on the study are not receiving temozolomide chemotherapy. We also have a surgical cohort on this patient that is open to those patients who may have had a, a biopsy only or a subtotal resection, and those patients that are amenable to a larger resection. Um, the thought behind that is that um, there was a small clinical trial um, published earlier this year where patients in the recurrent disease setting uh, received either, all of them went through another surgery, but they, before the surgery they received a dose of pembrolizumab or another group received the dose of pembrolizumab after the surgery. And what was demonstrated was that those patients who received at least one dose of pembrolizumab before the surgery did do better than those patients who received pembrolizumab after that surgery. Why is that important? Why could that make a difference? Well, we did see when, we, when those researchers evaluated the tumor in much detail and the bloodstream in, uh, in detail, uh, what we saw is that the tumor um, kind of shut down their cell profilation genes, um, so they could not grow as good anymore. And then we also saw that there was a more pro-inflammatory tumor profile seen in these cells, in these tumors. Um, therefore, now the thought is that perhaps you need a little bit of tumor there when the immune cells are first primed by the immunotherapy to better educate those immune cells. So there seems to be an important piece that we have to understand um, that happens when patients are exposed to immunotherapy, but then also they're having tumor that they can learn from. So for that reason, we have now included uh, a surgical cohort in our clinical study where a subset of patients can receive um, ipilimumab and nivolumab and have another resection and then go through the radiation phase after that other resection. <clears throat> I'm skip. All right, so now I wanna just highlight one other clinical trial that lo uh, looks at vaccine approach. Um, and that is, um, a study that has been conducted um, by my collaborators um, at, Roswell, at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, and the slides that I'm sharing with you um, have been um, shared by him, by Dr. Fenstermaker at the Roswell Park. Um, and I also want to highlight that this is a study that actually was also sponsored by the ABTA. Um, that's why I want to highlight 
this one in particular. Um, so Cervex M is a novel cancer vaccine that is designed to stimulate um, the immune response um, against the tumor. And the target that is offered or that's stimulated with this vaccine approach is a molecule called Survivin. So in a multicenter phase two clinical trial of Cervex M, um, patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma uh, received that vaccine together with the radiation and the chemotherapy. Um, as I said, the trial was led out of uh, Roswell Park Cancer Center. And what we can see in those Kaplan-Meier curves here is that um, both the overall survival and the progression-free survival for those patients who received the vaccine in addition to radiation chemotherapy was much improved. Based on those encouraging phase two data, um, there's now a 10-center randomized phase to study planned and in preparation is expected to open in 2020 and NYU is going to be a part of this uh, research. And then in addition, I just want to highlight one other study that's currently uh, will be open at NYU uh, shortly um, and that is so-called virus study. It's a surgical study, so it does require a patient to uh, go through another surgery. The study is open at time of recurrence. It is, um, this was a phase two study, a phase one study. A phase two study is going to open soon. Um, in the phase one study, what we saw is that when patients with recurrent GBM, when they underwent a uh, another tumor resection and they received a virus injection into the tumor that introduces a certain molecule called IL-12 um, that is a pro-inflammatory molecule into the tumor and they receive an activator drug called Velatamex um, that those patients do better than historical controls. That was a very encouraging phase one study and because of that we're now planning a phase two study that is evaluating the same approach, the virus plus the um, the Veladamix for patients uh, with recurrent progressive glioblastoma. Um, and that combines that same approach with a checkpoint inhibitor called semiplumab. Okay. I think I'm hearing a, um, I'm getting a warning in terms of time. I think I'm going to just very briefly go over low grade gliomas. We've heard about um, those before. Um, so low grade gliomas are rare tumors, about 5,000 new cases in the United States, States each year. As opposed to glioblastoma, typically young patients that are diagnosed with this. Clinical presentation is similar, seizures or neurological deficits. Um, MRI scans usually show um, a non-enhancing tumor. Uh, that's a little bit different compared to glioblastomas. Um, we do have good upfront treatments available with radiation and chemotherapy, um, but usually all tumors eventually recur and treatment options are limited. I'm going to skip over that. Um, but I, what I want to mention, and that came up um, earlier today, is that there are key, mark, uh, key alterations in those tumors seen called um, IDH mutations. Um, we see, do see them in 70 to 80 percent of uh, these low-grade gliomas, and IDH is important because, uh, because it confers a better prognosis for the patients, and it can possibly be targeted. Um, so this is just to highlight a study um, that looked at a compound called AG881 for IDH mutant gliomas, and what we, uh, what we saw in this study was that patients who received that treatment had a longer uh, period of disease control. And this um, is going to go into a phase uh, three study that is pl planned to open next year also. And then the last five minutes uh, that I'm hopefully having, uh, I just want to also highlight meningiomas. So meningiomas are actually the most common intracranial neoplasms um, with Many patients diagnosed in the United States each year. Patients are typically diagnosed in their 50s to 70s. Um, there is a female preponderance, so more females than males are diagnosed with, uh, with meningiomas. There are certain risk factors that have been identified, including radiation, diabetes, hypertension. Um, presentation, again, is uh, headaches, seizures, focal neurological deficits. We do differentiate three grades of meningiomas. Grade one, which is considered a benign tumor. Recurrence is rare, happens in about 5% of cases. Then there are grade two meningiomas where almost 40% of cases have recurrence at some point in their illness. And then there are grade three meningiomas or so-called anaplastic meningiomas where um, recurrence is almost always seen. So 80 to 94% of patients do recur after that diagnosis. Current treatment options um, include resection and radiation. Um, otherwise, there are no effective chemotherapies. And 
meningiomas is one of those areas in neuro-oncology where, where we have only a few clinical trials available nationwide. Uh, one clinical trial that we look at here at NYU is uh, targeting a receptor seen in meningiomas called somatostatin receptor type 2. That is a receptor that's overexpressed in all meningiomas, and it potentially is a promising treatment target. We target that with a drug called Lutathera. Lutathera is a radio-labeled somat somatostatin analog. That means it's a combination between a radio radio label or radioactive substance and an antibody that recognizes that somatostatin receptor type 2. And lutathera therefore can bind to somatostatin receptor type 2, and because of the radioactivity that's part of the compound, it can efficiently kill meningioma tumor cells. And we do know that it relatively protects the neighboring normal brain cells around that. Why are we interested in lutathera? Um, in other cancers that have strong somatostatin receptor type 2 expression, such as in neuroendocrine um, carcinoid tumors, um, clinical studies have shown significant improvement in survival for patients. And um, because this drug is now um, so successful in other cancers and because we see such high levels of somatostatin receptor 2 expression in many um, our study is the first one to open in the United States that is evaluating that approach. So the study that we have open right now is a multicenter phase 2 study um, that is evaluating that new agent lutathera for patients with progressive intracranial meningiomas. Um, and um, so all patients that enroll in the study receive that new treatment. It's given every eight weeks for a total of four doses. And we do special MRI scans before the first dose and then after the last dose to evaluate the success of that treatment. Um, so the study opened in July this year. We have eight patients enrolled so far. And the study is expected to open at other sites over the next few months. So to summarize what I uh, spoke about, so in general, uh, by conducting clinical trials, um, the clinical researchers evaluate novel and promising treatment options with the goal to improve treatments and outcomes for patients with brain tumors. Um, glioblastoma is the most common malignant intracranial tumor. The current so-called standard of care involves surgery followed by radiation plus temozolomide and monthly temozolomide cycles with novo TTF. And then there's a, um, there's a large number of clinical trials that evaluate immunotherapy approaches and or targeted treatment approaches for glioblastoma that are available here at NYU or other, at other institutions. For IDH mutant gliomas um, that occur mostly in young adult patients, we have uh, fewer clinical trials available. Um, nevertheless, there's currently a big interest um, in targeting the IDH mutation in those tumors. For meningiomas, we don't have many clinical trials available at this time, although um, it is the most common intracranial neoplasms. Um, but we're ho hoping to make a difference um, by developing more clinical trials in that space. And one of the uh, clinical trials that I highlighted is open here at NYU um, is that clinical trial that is targeting somatostatin receptor type 2 with uh, lutathera. With that, I would like to thank everyone who stayed until now, and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to kind of thank, yeah, take any questions and thank everyone who helped uh, organize the event, participate in the event, and sponsor the event. Do we have any questions from the audience at this time about this presentation? Thank you. Um, when the trial's ongoing in phase two or phase one or even phase three, even though it's randomized and controlled, um, are you as a, uh, you know, as a doctor able to see benefits, you know, through MRIs with your patients and understand which drugs are just performing better and then recommend those to kind of newer patients coming in? Yeah, that's a very important uh, question. Um, and. Yes, so of course, while we're conducting the studies, we do get information about the patients that we treat. Even on the multi-center studies, we have regular phone calls with the other centers that are running the same trial. And we do hear about how patients are doing at other uh, institutions also. And yes, we do get like an impression or a glimpse in terms of how this drug is performing or is not performing. And um, you know, I will share that experience with, uh, with patients. However, it is important to know that the ultimately, 
the ultimate evaluation of whether a drug is successful or not can only be performed after a clinical trial has been completed. And there's a lot of, there's, there are important statistical rules and things that have to go into this um, that really kind of are only done after uh, a clinical trial has been completed. So while a clinical trial is ongoing, although we may see promising or less promising results, it, those results have to be considered anecdotal. Um, and they cannot, you know, I cannot say that they're statistically significant or that this drug is going to be successful for sure. Just to kind of maybe illustrate that or give an example um, to that is that, you know, in a multicenter study, for instance, like I just may be lucky and my patients do well overall and I have a good experience with this particular drug. But, you know, as a whole, including the other sites compared to other institutions, um, the drug may actually not perform as well. Um, so, and I might therefore be biased because I only see the patients that are treated at my institution. And I might, I might not fully understand why, why my patients do better than those seen at others, other institutions. But of course, um, the longer study is ongoing, the more information we have about it. And also, I think that was part of your question. We will have more experience and information the further along the drug development process has been. So we will have more information for a phase two study compared to a phase one study, and we'll have more information that we can share for a phase three study compared to phase one or phase two studies. Other questions? Yep, coming over there. Give me a second. I'm getting in my workout today, you guys. <laughs> I wanted to know um, if, so I, assuming from what I'm seeing that anaplastic astrocytoma 3 is grouped with glioblastoma, is that the case? Uh, y yes and no. So um, based, we, we group anaplastic astrocytomas with glioblastoma into so-called high-grade glioma. So in that sense, um, they're grouped together. Now, when it comes to clinical trials, there may be clinical trials that allow for high-grade gliomas to go on study, and that would include anaplastic astrocytomas that are considered grade three. Um, other clinical trials might mandate um, that all participants are glioblastoma patients. So for those studies, anaplastic astrocytomas may not be allowed uh, to go on that, that, that study. That is, and I just want to maybe make that point um, because you're bringing it up, that that is depending on what the inclusion exclusion criteria look like. And I haven't mentioned that yet. So what are inclusion exclusion criteria? Um, so this is like a checklist of things that we as um, investigators um, have to look at and that will, def de um, that it will determine whether a patient is allowed to go on study or not. Meaning that with all the information we have about the patient, um, the patient must meet all inclusion criteria meaning I have to kind of check off all those boxes and cannot have any of the exclusion criteria. So I, I have to kind of check those boxes negative. Um, and what the tricky part becomes in different clinical trials is that uh, depending on what clinical trial you look at, the inclusion exclusion criteria might be different. And that's where it becomes a little bit of a puzzle, um, especially when you're like, a, as a patient, looking for a clinical trial, like with your particular tumor, your particular tumor grade, your particular molecular tumor profile, your patient age, your, like anything, how much tumor was resected or not resected, all of those are important details um, that may allow you or may not allow you to go on a particular clinical trial. Um, and that is sometimes disappointing for patients because they think like, you know, they can't go on a clinical trial, but when they then go and see the doctor that runs the clinical trial, the patient is informed that he cannot because of the one or the other um, detail that doesn't match the inclusion exclusion criteria. Okay. I have one follow up then. Are you taking part in what I think is called the basket basket study where they it's for different kinds of cancers but the molecular profile it like target is the same regardless of whether it's breast or brain or Correct, yes, I didn't highlight those but yes, we have uh, a few of those clinical trials also open. So what Maybe I just explain that uh, to the audience. So a basket study um, is, for instance, like let me give you the example of a targeted therapy study, right? So where, like one target 
um, might be shared by different types of cancers and therefore, for instance, HER2 can be seen in breast cancer but also can be seen in um, brain tumors um, and that target, the, the eligibility to participate in these trials is not determined by what type of tumor you have, what grade of tumor you have, it is just determined by if you have that marker present um, and uh, so everyone can participate in, in that study. That yeah, we do offer that, and then there might be like different treatment arms that evaluate each of the disease groups separately, um, and we, we have those. We work with our phase one group um, on those. We have time, I think, for one or two more questions. So does anyone else have questions right now? Up front? Oh, here? Thank you so much. That was a great presentation, very uh, informative. I'm trying to word this question. Um, I might be a little bit ignorant, but it's just, I know there's a lot of interdisciplinary uh, collaboration in the hospitals, institutions, and you mentioned even like Columbia, NYU, having in the same area in the city. But how much cross-collaboration is there with other institutions like say in Mass like Massachusetts and Connecticut to like for factors that like limit morbidity and mortality within the hot, like with the, for certain surgical procedures, recovery. Um, there's a lot of research and it's great to talk about research trials, but how about like other techniques, things to do to help patients recover um, from surgery? Is there, do you feel like it's effective, the, you know, working with your colleagues in other places or is that something that needs to be continued developed? Yeah, great question. So, like, in general, I would say that so neuro oncology is a relatively small field. That means that, like, across the country, like, we know each other really very well. I would say that compared to other fields, there is uh, a lot of crosstalk uh, to other colleagues, other institutions, um, and you know, we meet each other regularly at other meetings. Um, I would say that like, um, I do regularly interact with. Um, other colleagues, like in the city or even um, other places across the country, um, about you know research, clinical trials that they may perform, I'm performing, um, I want them to participate, they want me to participate, um, or I may, might kind of reach out to them and say, I have this challenge in case, what would you do, what, what, what's your thought on it, and you know, I'm getting my opinion from um, other, like, um, other neuro-oncologists in the field um, elsewhere. I, I, I would say I have a very good report and relationship um, with other people anywhere in the country, and it's a very tightly knit field. Um, I also, but nevertheless, it's also true that, you know, I mentioned that sometimes can't be a puzzle to find that right clinical trial for you, and there's so many clinical trials, so even for us, it's un impossible to know the nitty gritty details of each single clinical trial that's available anywhere in the country. Of course, we are biased, so I do know the clinical trials that are available here best. I may know a little bit more about, like, you know, the clinical trials that are available uh, in New York City because that's where I most interact with people. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that I don't reach out to other colleagues and find out what they have, may have available. We have time for one more question. Is there any other question in the audience right now? Okay, great. So this isn't exactly about clinical trials. Um, it's a general question. I'm actually in the market of finding a new, um, I guess, team for my husband. And I've always thought I'm supposed to start with the neurosurgeon as the first choice. But since it's such a big group that kind of handles brain tumors, is that the right you know, it, obviously the facility is, a, is a, an important factor where, but is that the starting point? Is the neurosurgeon that you should go to first when you're trying to find a new um, doctor to follow, you know, somebody who's, you know, still a survivor, but there's a chance of recurrence. And for me, I want to be plugged in now and not wait like the first time when he, you know, the seizure presented itself and that's how we knew we had a tumor. There wasn't enough time to do the research. So, now I'm doing my research, and um, I just assumed neurosurgeon was the first top of the food chain, but I'm not, now I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, that's a, a great question. Um, so I would say, like, when I said, like, about the neuro-oncology field and that we're, like, a tightly knit group and, you know, it's a small group, we know each other, so that group includes neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, neuro-oncologists, medical oncologists, nurses, like, you know, everyone who deals with patients and brain tumors. Now, in terms of what the treatment team 
looks like for a given patient. Um, all of these disciplines are part of that treatment team also. Um, I would say that typically, it depends a little, like what your entry person is into the treatment team, depends a little bit on what your most pressing issue is at the moment. Um, so I would say at the time of new diagnosis, when you're landing in the ER because your husband had a seizure or what have you, um, and you find out about this tumor the first time, then I think the surgeon is probably the most important uh, person at that moment because the next step is clearly surgery. Um, but then after that, like, you know, usually I am the person who's meeting with the patient after surgery, um, and I am the person who's explaining the diagnosis to the patient and outlining the treatment plan. And then, of course, we have the patient also see the radiation oncologist for um, their recommendation, and then, you know, we formulate a treatment plan as a team that includes the surgeon and the radiation oncologist and anyone else who plays a role here. Um, and then during the radiation phase, the radiation oncologist becomes that most important person um, of treatment. And then I I would say after that, it's me who um, is becoming the quarterback person, so to speak. So I do see the patient more, most often because of the chemotherapy that patient is receiving or the clinical trial visits or uh, the imaging studies that are necessary. Um, and at that point, I would say a neuro-oncologist or a medical oncologist are the most important entry point. So for like a patient with a recurrent tumor that is looking for a new treatment team, I would say that the, the oncologist is probably the most important entry point. Um, in terms of clinical trials, so all of us run clinical trials. So there are surgeons running clinical trials, radiation oncologists running clinical trials, medical oncologists or neuro-oncologists running clinical trials. Um, but I think at, like, you know, if surgery is not the most pressing question at the moment, it's probably better to start with the oncologist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurtz. I think today was just a wonderfully informative um, day. Would you all agree? Did you get something out of today in some way? Good. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I just wanted to thank NYU Langone Health and Dr. Kurtz and Dr. Solman for such a phenomenal program. Um, they definitely poured their heart into this, and you can tell that they selected really top quality clinicians to come out here and, and speak with us today. Um, again, I, I apologize we couldn't get to all of the questions, but I encourage you to please, um, once we step out, take a moment um, and ask those questions that you still had. I'm going to take a moment also to remind everyone that there are evaluations in your folders. I mentioned it at the beginning of today's seminar, but we really take those evaluations seriously. We comb through them and we take your advice and feedback and we try to make this better every year. So I encourage you to please take a moment to fill that out and you can leave that at the registration desk with Umbreen. Um, and if you need any validated parking, she will also be able to give that to you. If you have any other questions, please come see myself or Umbreen. We'll be at the registration table. But thank you for this opportunity. I think I learned just as much from you guys um, today, and I, I know speaking for some of the clinicians, it's really a pleasure to be um, around so much positivity and, and hope in this room. So thank you, and give yourselves a round of applause for today. And enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everyone.